Good morning and welcome to St. John Church Sunday broadcast. We're really happy you could join us for worship today. If you are following on a Sunday, please do join us for our tea and coffee fellowship at 11 o'clock. Just go onto our website and look up the Zoom information. Also, we do have our vestry meeting coming up. Please look on the website for more information on that. Your report, vestry reports will be sent out, um, but they will be sent out electronically unless you would like a hard copy. And if you'd like a hard copy of it, please let us know. Please call me in the office and she can uh, mail you a hard copy. Also, do remember that we do have morning prayer Monday to Friday at 9 a.m. every day. And uh, just again, go onto the website and look up the Zoom information. We'd love to have you there. Let us take a moment now to prepare ourselves for holy worship. Prepare the way of the Welcome, it's nice to see you for children's time at St. John's. Did you know that Jesus was a teacher? Well, he was, but not the type of teacher that you're familiar with. His classroom was wherever he was, or wherever he happened to be, on a beach, in a boat, in a field, in a forest, or even in somebody's house. And he told stories. How cool was that? He didn't use textbooks. And the only homework he signed was for his students to live their lives by loving God and loving each other. The stories that Jesus told are called parables. And they are like gifts that we can open time after time after time. So let's see what's in the parable box this week. It's the parable of the mustard seed. It goes like this. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? Well, it's so small that if you dropped it, you'd have a hard time finding it. But I wonder what a mature mustard plant looks like. I've never seen one. Well, I have an idea. Let's try thinking about this parable in a way that we can better understand it. Here is something that we're all familiar with. You probably see them when you're out playing in the park. Well, they're helicopters or whirly gigs, and it's the winged seed produced by a maple tree. And just like the mustard seed, in Jesus' parable, it too grows into a tree so large that crows and robins and Stellar's jays come to perch amid its beautiful boughs and branches. I wonder if Jesus was trying to tell us that the beginning of our love for God is like a tiny seed. 
It starts out small at first and then grows into something that's so big. Just like the birds, we come to rest in the arms of its beauty and safety. Like the kingdom of God right here on earth. I wonder. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for children, for their bright spirits, their inquisitive minds, and their gentle hearts. Give their spirit wings to fly into your loving canopy. May they rest there to find their song and sing it. Thanks be to God. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. If you are following along in the bulletin, please feel free to read the song with me. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. O Lord, your work is full of majesty and splendor and your righteousness endures forever. You make your marvelous works to be remembered, and you are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you. You are ever mindful of your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands and faithfulness and justice, all your commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, because they are done in truth and equity. You send redemption for your people. You commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. The praise of the Lord endures forever.
A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now, concerning food, sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many idols, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you, what have you do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching? What authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our rock. In the Gospel reading from Mark today, Jesus heals a man. Specifically, Jesus releases the man from the grip of an unclean spirit. That may have well been the case, but with the knowledge we have today, Jesus more likely cured a man of a devastating and lifelong mental illness. Either way, Jesus performs a miracle, and the man is instantly healed and made well. My simple and yet not so simple question to you is, why does Jesus do this? Why does Jesus heal this man? I'll let you think about that for a moment. Biblical scholars might have given a number of answers to this question. 
Jesus performs a miracle to show and prove he is who he says he is, the Son of Man. Jesus saves people's lives because the prophets of old foretold that the Messiah would do such works as these. Jesus, by doing such miracles, shows his power over evil and indeed his power over all earthly life. These are fine answers to the question of why Jesus does this, why Jesus heals this man. However, there is one more important answer to this question, and I will devote the rest of my sermon trying to explain it. We can find the primary answer to this question of why Jesus heals this man, and many others, of course, in part of all of the readings we have appointed for this Sunday. From Deuteronomy, we hear, Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. In other words, the prophet, Jesus, will in all ways do the will of God. In Psalm 111 we hear, O Lord, your work is full of majesty and splendor, and your righteousness endures forever. You make your marvelous works to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. In other words, we have a creator whose being is full of grace, mercy, and love. In 1 Corinthians we hear, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all our things who, from whom all, all things for we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. In other words, God is in all things, and we are all God's creation, and we are all God's instruments. Here on earth. And in the gospel reading, a very sick person is healed. In other words, God loves us and heals us. Therefore, back to my simple and yet not so simple question to you why does Jesus do this? Why does Jesus heal this man? Before I answer that, a bit of a necessary detour, but I promise I will come back to it. Over the past few weeks, I have had a number of conversations with parishioners about the political turmoil and indeed violence that has occurred in the United States surrounding their election and the change in presidential administrations. In particular, I have had deep conversations regarding the riotous attack and would not argue in calling it an insurrection on the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. on January 9th. Like many, I was horrified and entirely shaken to see this powerful symbol of democracy in the free world, and indeed the world itself, damaged and defied. I was left shaking my head in disbelief, as there was a loss of life, and if not for some courageous and fast-acting fast police inside of the building, the elected officials could well have been taken hostage or worse. It is an event I thought I would never see in America. And let us all pray that we will never see anything like it again. What consistently came up in my conversations around this event was the deep resentment and visceral anger that was felt towards those who had carried out this outrageous act against free and fair elections, and in fact against democracy itself. I understand that. I felt it myself. When I saw a man using a hockey stick as a violent weapon against an officer who was defenseless on the ground, I was feeling far less than merciful. These thugs, I thought, deserve no leniency, and when brought to justice, deserve the full weight of the law to be held against them. What really struck me in these conversations was the level of anger we were both experiencing. One person said to me, in a moment of true and guttural revelation, 
that what they resented most was how these people have come to make them feel. That is to say, what was bothering them most was the anger and rage they saw in the mob on the Capitol building was now within them. To be precise, the violent mob had made them want to do harm, had made them feel that the best response to this outrage was to be outrageous and right back and inflict pain and suffering on those who took part. I understand that sentiment too. I do. It is a very human response to being violently attacked. But I also know that we cannot, that we must not, stay in that sentiment, particularly as Christians. We must move from that place to a different place. There is another way, a better way, to ending social division and having a lasting peace. In his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote these words. In a real sense, all life is interrelated. All people are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly, affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. In this passage from his letter, Martin Luther King is saying pretty much the same thing as Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, that God is in all things, and we are God's creation and we are all God's instruments here in the world. That single garment that ties us all together, now and for always, is God's love. God created us in love, and God wants us to use our love as an instrument to make this world just and equal and caring and nurturing and forgiving and loving for all humankind. The question then is how do we get from anger and hate to loving those who would do us real harm? And how should we do that? To help answer that question, I would like to take you back to Washington, D.C., this time on January 20th. Near the end of the inauguration of the new president, America's youth poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, performed her poem the hill we climb. I believe it to be an instant masterpiece of literature and a breathtaking inspiration to a divided nation. The last lines of the poem are these. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light if we're only brave enough to see it, if we're only brave enough to be it. There is indeed always light. It is the light of God that created us, that sustains us, and that light will always be with us. That light of God, like all light, guides us on our way. But Amanda Gorman is absolutely right. We walk with God in light, but we can also choose a different path. We can walk away from the light. The light is the love of God, and the love of God is lost on us if we are not brave enough to see it. The love of God is lost on us if we are not brave enough to be it. As Christians, we are called to love all others, including our enemies, unconditionally and with all our strength, with all our mind, with all our heart, and with all our soul. This is not easy work. In fact, at times, it is really hard. How do you fix a fractured and divided society? You do it by loving those who fractured it and divided it. You do it by understanding the anger of the other, by accepting the frustration 
of the other. By looking into the eyes of the other and seeing the loved child of God. The fact is, we are all interconnected and interrelated. And the dis-ease of the other will affect us negatively until that dis-ease is gone. And God may well ask us to be instruments in that change. And now, back to my simple and yet not so simple question. Why did Jesus perform his miracle and heal this severely diseased man? He did it because he could do no other. Jesus healed this person because it is the nature of God to heal and to forgive and to have mercy and to love unconditionally. It is the nature of God to bring light where there is darkness, to bring understanding where there is division, to bring love where there is hate. It is the nature of God to be love in our world because God is love in our world. Why does Jesus heal? Because that is what love does. I believe on a daily basis, God gives us the gift and the opportunity to be instruments of light and love in our world. Oftentimes, it is an easy thing to do. Sometimes, it is a difficult thing to do. And so more times, it may seem an impossible thing to do. But as Christians, we are called to be Jesus in our world. And that means we can do no other than bring love to a situation or to a challenge. God's love will always abide with us and will always endure with us. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Amen. If you are following along at home, we are at the top of page 8 of your bulletin, and if you would like, please rise, and with me, let us confess the faith of our baptism, as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please take a comfortable position for prayer. The response to the words, Lord, in your mercy, is hear our prayer. It is our privilege to pray for your world and for your people. And so we put our prayers at your feet on this day. Lord, we pray for those in the news, in the lab, in the classroom, in the grocery store. Those working hard to keep us safe, to keep life normal to keep us healthy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Holy One, we pray for our church community, the body of the church worldwide, our life together in Christ, and our witness to the world. We pray for our church leaders and their commitment to guiding us in faith and holding us steady to celebrating with us, to consoling with us, to creating community, to setting an example through faith. We pray for the many members of the St. John's community who share their talents, their time and faith with and through others, contributing to our community and advancing our mission. We pray especially for Archbishop Melissa, Linda, our primate, Mark McDonald, the Indigenous Archbishop of Canada, and Patrick, our cherished priest. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who've met, who we've met or talked to in the last week or so, or even this week, the last few weeks, someone who has important issues to face and may be struggling. We pray for the dilemmas faced by our own family and friends or their emotions if they're struggling as we ride the wave of January and COVID fatigue and are seeking light and hope at the end of the horizon. We pray for those coping with the normalities of life stress, whether at work, at home, or just life in general, and, we f- and are feeling that the world is a tiresome place, are feeling depleted. Especially we pray for any friend, family member, or colleague in need right now. We say their name aloud, or we say their name under our breath. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those who are waiting for something important in their lives, a birth, a wedding, a new home, a phone call, an appointment, a signal of forgiveness. Especially today, we pray for anyone who's longing for love, companionship, or friendship or who is finding the loneliness of social distancing and social isolation is wearing on their spirit. We pray for all members of the St. John's community, suffering in body, mind, or spirit. Hear our prayers today, especially for these members of our community, for Berna, Bruce and Ann, Elsie, Kelly, Dorothy, Jay, L. Allison, Andy and Riley, Mahara Nissa, Doreen, Ruby, Francis, Flo, Barbara, Carla and family, CLJT, Sandro, Leslie, Janice, Brock, Ron and Rosemary, Pat, Lynn, Perry, Maria, Joan, Liam, Heather, Anne, Avis, Yvonne, Joel, Leone, Omid, and Everett. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Holy One, we pray for the departed, those who are no longer with us and have returned home to you, those whose love and spirit will live on through us forever, ever. We pray especially today for Wilma Young, for the family and friends that she leaves behind. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Father, every person we have mentioned in our hearts is known and loved by you more than we could ever ask or imagine. We entrust them to you in confidence, knowing that our prayers will be used for their healing and well-being. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes us and invites all of us to this day. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, for the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon 
eternal and deliver you from all of your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all things, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you're home alone, you can stand, and if you're not, maybe stand with someone else you're around, and let us share the peace, the love, the joy, the light that is Jesus Christ our Lord. Peace be with you.
We give you thanks and praise, loving Father, because in sending Jesus, your Son, to us, you showed us how much you love us. He cares for the poor and the hungry. He suffers with the sick and the rejected. Betrayed and forsaken, he did not strike back, but overcame hatred with love. On the cross, he defeated the power of sin and death. By raising him from the dead, you show us the power of your love to bring new life to all your people. Glory to you forever and ever. On the night before he gave up his life for us, Jesus, at supper with his friends, took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of a new and eternal covenant, which is shed for you and for many, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of love. I would invite you to put your hand over your heart and accept the communion of God. If you're following along in your bulletin, we are on page 15. And let us pray together. Source of all goodness, in this Eucharist we are nourished by the bread of heaven and invigorated with new wine. May these gifts renew our lives, that we may show your glory to all the world. In the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind and knowledge in the love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you this day and forever and ever and always. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, let us go forth from this place and your place, and let us see the light. Let us be the light. Thanks be to God.